Uh, and welcome to breakfast with the Chiefs. Uh, one quick uh, housekeeping note for those of you who are making your first uh, trip to uh, Sick Kids is in front of you is a mic uh, for the Q&A. Uh, in order to uh, activate the mic, you press the button in front of you, and if the, mic, if the button is red, you have the floor. If it's flashing red, you're in the queue. Okay, so when, when it is your turn to ask a question, at, at least uh, raise your hand so we know where you are. Um, uh, as always with Breakfast with the Chiefs, uh, it's important to thank our sponsors. Uh, sponsoring today is the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Uh, IBM, I think I saw Paul Salkers. Is Paul here somewhere? He is somewhere. There he is. Uh, also, Hims Ontario, I think Gloria and Anne are here. And uh, again, thanks for Sick Kids uh, for making the facility available this morning. For more than 15 years, Longwoods has been, been, been producing Breakfast with the Chiefs, and it continues to be the premier healthcare lecture series in uh, Canada. And making his first appearance at Breakfast with the Chiefs. Uh, is the Global Vice President of Health Advisory Services Group for HIMSS Analytics, John Daniels. Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here this morning. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I, uh, I, I love this building. This place is beautiful. Um, Maybe because it's a children's hospital, and I like children's hospitals, I don't know, but this is an absolutely beautiful building. So whoever's responsible for this place, congratulations. Uh, you've done a great job. Uh, I came all the way from Texas to come and spend uh, an hour with you guys, and <laughs> I'm, I've been very much looking forward to this. I, I do get the opportunity to speak uh, quite frequently around the world. This is probably the first... Uh, speaking opportunity I've had in Canada for a while because I primarily spend most of my time in Asia, uh, the Asia Pacific region or the uh, Middle East and Latin America. Uh, but I have um, a great resource on my team by the name of Philip Bradley, who is a CIO, CTO, works with us. He manages our North America region and a lot of times he takes care of everything in North America. I don't have to worry about anything because he's really good at what he does and, and loves what he does. Uh, in fact, he was up here not too long ago um, working with the Ontario Hospital Association on some things. Uh, so, uh, which is another thing I want to mention too is I think we, HIMSS Analytics is very privileged to have a great working relationship with the OHA. Uh, we've been working with the OHA for many years, and uh, we enjoy it very much. And so uh, one thing I thought was weird when I got into the airport last night is that, wait a second, I have to go through customs? <laughs> but this is Canada and the U.S. We're like, you know, brothers and sisters, or I don't know who the brother is or the sister is, but, you know, we're a close family. Uh, but I thought it was kind of weird. But anyway, and I'll have to go through customs again when I go back, but that's okay. I'm used to that. I do travel all around the world. I have the opportunity to visit hospitals in just about every region of the world with the exception of Africa. We haven't done any uh, really uh, visits or work in Africa yet, but it's beginning to, um, beginning to, to we're beginning to see some interest there. Uh, some in South Africa, but we, we're working with a couple of organizations in Tunisia and Algeria. And I am going to Egypt in December to do a stage six validation for a hospital there. I can't tell you who it is because uh, in case they don't get validated, I don't want them to be embarrassed. So we keep that information confidential until they actually do get validated. Uh, but we'll have our first uh, North Africa validation of a hospital in December, fingers crossed, if it's successful, which is pretty exciting which means then that we'll be on every continent uh, of the world. Uh, the EMR adoption model, which I'll talk about here in a minute, is uh, being used to help organizations uh, build their roadmap for adopting IT. But that's not the only thing I want to talk about this morning. So I really want to focus, focus on uh, some of the focal points as I see them in health IT. And hopefully a lot of these things will resonate with you. We already had some comments this morning about cybersecurity, so I'll talk about that for a minute. Um, I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to be running back and forth. That's not a problem. HIMSS Analytics. For those of you who don't know about HIMSS Analytics, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of HIMSS, uh, and this is our particular mission uh, within HIMSS Analytics, and that's who I work for uh, is HIMSS Analytics. 
HIMSS itself, the parent organization, is a nonprofit organization. So it is a global organization that is focused on that mission of transforming healthcare through the best use of IT. Uh, we're not the only subsidiary within HIMSS, if you will. There are uh, several others. I've only highlighted three up here, HIMSS Analytics being one of those. But just to give you an idea of the makeup of the organization, uh, we are not for profit. Uh, our focus really is on our cause based mission. And, um, and that mission is better health through information technology. HIMSS Analytics, of course, we provide different types of services. I'm not here to give you a commercial, but just to give you an idea of the sort of the things that we do and what enables me to be able to give you the information that I'm going to be giving you today is our ability to collect information on all the various healthcare markets around the world to be able to present to organizations and government health authorities and others uh, what the current maturity level is of IT adoption around the world. And that, that's really what we're able to do. Uh, it brings a service to all of the different countries and different markets because if you know where you are and what your capabilities are, that then gives you sort of a baseline from which to begin to grow and improve and optimize. So we, um, we're very happy to be able to provide that service to the world. Um, I, I put this slide in here because I want to make it clear that we are uh, a, a not-for-profit and that we are vendor agnostic. We're technology neutral. We don't, um, we're not like a class in the U.S. where they rate organizations and they rate vendors. We don't do that. We really want to be totally vendor neutral, technology agnostic in, in all of the services and the things that we do. So... Just a quick plug there. Now, to get into what we're going to be talking about today, there's a reason why we're all here together. I talked about the HIMSS mission and the HIMSS analytics mission, but I bet each of you uh, in your own individual organizations have your own organizational mission, whatever that may be. But there's one part of your mission and our mission that brings us together, and that's that, that little piece here of why we're here this morning, is to talk about how can we improve Information, healthcare and healthcare delivery and individual health through the best use of information technology. So with that shared mission in mind, let's go on this quick journey today. There's, there's lots of things that are driving this particular mission that we're on within HIMSS and HIMSS Analytics. One of those, of course, is the fact that back in 1999, the Institutes of Medicine, now it's called the National something something, they changed the name, uh, but it's the same organization, new name. They released a report that basically said in the US, we were killing about 100,000 people a year uh, as a result of medical errors. They estimated about 7,000 of those were medication errors alone. And they're also estimated about 57,000 people die each year without even health care at all. Uh, in the UK, we're not alone. In the UK, they report about 40,000 deaths a year um, from medical errors. 7% of those, uh, it, it basically represents 7% of the deaths in the UK. Many of those they feel are preventable medication errors. And they also report that missed healthcare opportunities has cost the European society about $70 billion, which is a, a pretty big number. But the point on this uh, slide here is to say that these challenges are, are not unique to the US or to the UK. They truly are challenges shared around the world. And if there's one thing that I've learned in my travels all around the world, that is that no matter where I go, everyone seems to be facing the same issues, the same challenges. Everyone's trying to do more with less. Everyone's trying to reduce hospital admissions, hospital acquired infections. Everyone's trying to reduce length of stay, improve patient safety, improve outcomes, reduce inequality, and so on and so forth. I would bet that you're facing some of this, these same challenges within Canada, right? I see a lot of heads nodding. So uh, we're all facing the same challenges then uh, in the U.S., it seems to be getting a little worse. So in 2016, uh, remember in 1999, the IOM said that we were killing 100,000 people a year. Well, now in 2016, Johns Hopkins did a, a study, and they reported that medical errors is now the third leading cause of death in the U.S. So if you don't die from cancer and you don't die from heart disease, guess what? If you end up in a hospital, you could die in a hospital. Um, it, it's, that's pretty sad. But has the problem really gotten worse? 
Or is it we've just been able to use IT to identify errors and, and to be more accurate at reporting the kinds of deaths or the mistakes that are being made within hospitals? It's probably a little of both, but who knows? So in summary, <laughs> Hospitals may be hazardous to your health, and it shouldn't be that way, right? You should, people should be able to trust hospitals and go into a hospital and know that they're going to be taken care of and they're not going to die because of a mistake. Uh, humans do make mistakes, but uh, we don't want to make the kind of mistakes that end up costing someone's life. So medical knowledge, as we know, continues to grow on an exponential basis. I mean, the amount of medical knowledge we're gaining just grows more and more every day. And those people who are taking care of us patients have to know this information so that they can make the right decision. But it's impossible for them to know everything and to remember everything and to recall everything there is to know about whatever disease or condition that they're dealing with and, and helping you with. So when they're overloaded with all of this information, what tends to happen is they forget something or they overlook something or they truncate stuff uh, and, and end up making the wrong decision, uh, which of course uh, could result in an error which could unfortunately uh, cause a death. So this is where information technology comes in. So what we, what we think, and I think what a lot of people are beginning to recognize worldwide, is that there's value in using information technology to help us eliminate or avoid a lot of these preventable, preventable medical errors that are occurring. So the idea is to use technology to intervene and to help the decision maker with their decision making by bringing the most relevant information they need when they need it, right? So that's really the, the, the reason why we want to invest in technology is to help those who are making care decisions make the right decisions. I mean, the fundamental challenge here is that we've got to make sure that they're getting the, that the right people have the right information at the right time to do the right thing, right? We want to make it very hard to do the wrong thing. I did a presentation in Brazil, no, I'm sorry, Australia, a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago. I focus purely on medication administration. And I have several slides and some, some case studies where technology was not being used to administer medication. And when you look at medication, different medications and their packaging side by side, it's no wonder we're making mistakes because they look exactly the same. One quote that I like to use is that the difference between uh, medicine and poison is the dose. Right? So with IT, 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 we should expect that the system or information technology should help us making sure that we're giving the right patient the right medication at the right time, at the right dose, and the right route. And if any of those things don't match, then the system should stop the process and, and, and keep the nurse from giving uh, the wrong medication or the wrong dose. All right, so with all of these challenges and with all of this, uh, these issues that we all face globally, uh, what can we do to, to begin to address them using information technology? And this is where uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the tools that HIMSS Analytics has put together to help organizations uh, build a strategy to address some of these challenges and issues using information technology. So what I've got listed up here are what we like to call the uh, benchmark suite within HIMSS Analytics, the maturity models. These truly are uh, roadmaps that we've developed uh, to uh, give to markets around the world, to hospitals and uh, ambulatory organizations to help them build a roadmap so they don't have to invent uh, a strategy from scratch. If they're trying to figure out how are we going to implement technology, in what order, what should we prioritize uh, our investments in in terms of technology, these tools serve as a great uh, roadmap to help organizations build their strategy and to focus on those things that will help them um, achieve whatever goals and objectives they've set for their particular organization. So I'm going to go through some of these very briefly this morning. I also like to, to be a little informal in my presentation. So if there's any questions that come up in the middle, you need to interrupt me. If I use an acronym that is not familiar, please 
raise your hand and, and let's talk because I, I don't want to lose you as we get through this. Um, before we dive into the models, let me just quickly say why a maturity model is helpful in an organization. For one thing, uh, one of the guiding principles that we keep in mind as we develop new models is that we want this model to, be a, to have a benchmarking capability. We want it to be objective, we want it to be measurable, and we want organizations to be able to benchmark themselves against others. Uh, by being able to do the benchmarking that allows you or enables the organizations to be able to learn from others' experiences. What are the best practices that organizations have been able to implement to help them achieve a specific objective? Uh, and so the a maturity model used uh, in um, the markets around the world gives you the ability to learn from others. Uh, it also provides a roadmap. You've heard me say this several times now that this is a great roadmap. It, it truly is a roadmap. These models uh, start from the very basic capabilities or no capabilities from an IT perspective and work their way up progressively. Uh, to uh, um, the highest level in each of the models, which represents uh, an advanced uh, or an organization with advanced IT capabilities. So they really are nice roadmaps. It's not to say that you have to implement all of these capabilities in a specific order, because we see organizations doing it in different orders, and it really depends on your organization and what your objectives are and what you're trying to accomplish and the challenges that you're facing. So. Um, again, it's just a suggested roadmap. Uh, you don't have to follow it exactly, but it certainly helps you uh, from having to reinvent the wheel. From a, a leadership perspective, the maturity model, a maturity model, helps to convey a vision. So if you're the CEO of an organization and you know where you need to go and where you need to take that organization, but you're not exactly sure how to get there, the maturity model helps you to convey that vision to the rest of the organization. If it's related to IT, then use the maturity model to say, okay, folks, here's where we need to be, and here's a model, here's a roadmap that we can all put our heads around. It's tangible. We can, we can grab it on a piece of paper. Uh, we've got people we can talk to, but this is a roadmap that's going to help guide us to get us to where we need to be, and, and it's a great communication tool. And so it, it's... Um, it helps to convey a, a vision. I think it also helps encourage organizations to work closer together, to work more collaboratively. I've done many stage seven validations for a state, an organization to be considered uh, or uh, awarded a stage seven status on any of the models. We have to physically go to that facility almost like a, an accreditation visit. We go and we verify with our own eyes that, yes, they have these capabilities, they are using this technology, so on and so forth. Um, and at the end of the successful Stage 7 validations, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the CEOs and the COOs and, and the nurses and the physician leaders come to me and say, you know, the Stage 7 recognition is nice, and we really appreciate that, but the greatest value we've gotten out of this journey getting to stage seven is watching the team come together and meld together as a well-oiled machine and working very closely together uh, and uh, just seeing them basically shine as, as, a, as a, uh, a very collaborative uh, team working together to get to this point. So I like to say that encourages the organization to really come together around a common goal, a common vision, this roadmap, uh, and whatever the, the end objective, the end result is to be, it brings the team together. So it, it's a nice tool. But you don't have to take my word for it. Um, this is a slide that was presented by a stage seven hospital in China. Um, I think the CEO summed it up when he gave his opening presentation when we arrived on site to do our validation visit. He said, before we do anything, let, let me tell you how we use this model and why we used it. And so he put a nice presentation together. This sort of sums it up, but this is his slide that I borrowed. <laughs> um, and and I, I use that disclaimer all the time. When I go to a hospital and they give their presentation to the first hour and a half in the morning of a visit is the hospital telling us how great they are and sharing us, uh, with us their capabilities. 
And so I always tell them, okay, now that you've given me the presentation, please give me a copy because I'm going to use a lot of those slides in the presentations I do around the world. And this is one example. But they, they have used the EMR adoption model in this particular case. Um, the CEO used it to help him provide guidance for IT strategic planning in the organization. So it was a good tool for him to be able to do that. It also gave them a tool to be able to benchmark their IT efforts, be able to tell whether or not they were actually making progress as compared to other organizations that were on a similar journey. The other thing is that it gave him the ability to build a business case for investing in the technology that they needed to achieve their strategic objectives in the organization. So the EMR adoption model helped them to provide that justification or build that justification for the investment. So from his perspective, and again, this is one CEO, but I can tell you that the, the same ideas are very consistent in almost every stage seven or hospital that I've visited or organization, stage seven organization around the world. So let's dive into the maturity models for just a minute. What I've listed, what I'm showing up here are the two EMR adoption models. Uh, the one on your left is the hospital or the inpatient acute care model, and the one on the right is the outpatient ambulatory model. So I'm not gonna go through the models in detail because uh, that's not what uh, my intention was this morning, but what I really wanna do at a high level is to say, okay, if you're looking at all of the benchmark suites, the tools from Hims Analytics, where do you start? Uh, because there's, a, there's, you know, I showed you four models, and those aren't the only four, by the way. Um, where do I start? In my view, you really need to establish a foundation upon which you can collect the data uh, and be able to build a clinical decision support system to achieve that objective that we talked about earlier, using information technology to make sure the right information gets to the right person so they can make the right decision at the right time, right? So the foundation really becomes uh, sort of the EMR environment or the EHR environment, I think uh, it's referred to here in Canada. Building that foundation is critical because without that IT infrastructure where you're collecting this data electronically and in a discrete form so that that data can be used to drive other initiatives, analytics, um, clinical decision support, and so forth, you've got to have this foundation in place. So the EMR adoption models serve as a nice uh, tool to get started, uh, but it also serves as a tool to help you build that foundation in, at whatever point in the journey you are. The models are eight stage models from stage zero to stage seven. A stage zero organization is basically an organization that hasn't implemented any technology at all, no EMR. They might have a PAX, they might have a pharmacy system, but that's it. And then as they implement various capabilities, um, <laughs> sorry, I was winking. Um, as they implement various capabilities, they, they then progressively advance their EMR environment until they get to stage seven, which represents an organization that's virtually paperless. They don't use paper to order medications or imaging or labs. They don't use paper to document nursing notes or um, nursing encounters in a clinic. They don't use paper to do physician documentation. They really don't use paper for anything. Uh, everything is in the system, so they've established a very strong foundation upon which then they can begin to build on and optimize. I consistently tell stage seven hospitals and organizations, when they get to stage seven, don't think that you're done. When you get to stage seven, that's just the beginning. All you've done is established a foundation from which you can then build upon and optimize and strengthen the organization in terms of how you're using technology to drive improvements and outcomes. So, so getting to stage seven is just the beginning of your journey, right? So that's very important to have that, that foundation. Some of the critical things within uh, both the inpatient and the outpatient model, of course, is being able to document information within the patient's electronic record. It's one thing to just document something as in a note writer, but it's another thing to be collecting information in such a way that that information can be used 
to trigger clinical decision support recommendations or advice back to the physicians or the nurses. Um, it's the only way, it, it, you've got to be able to have discrete data to drive analytics down the road. If you've got population health initiatives, if you've got process improvement initiatives, you need data to support those initiatives and to make sure you're making the right decision. Establishing this EMR foundation is what's going to help you get to that advanced uh, analytics capability, that advanced interoperability or information exchange capability. Uh, those are going to be very important. So start with establishing a foundation, right? Very quickly, the profile of a stage six and stage seven organization. Remember I said this is really just the beginning once they get to stage six and stage seven, but what we're consistently finding at those, in those organizations that have gotten to stage six and stage seven are that they truly are data driven. Uh, they're using data to drive uh, improvements in processes, improvements in financial management, uh, improvements in clinical quality, safety, and privacy and security. Uh, privacy and security is relatively new. We have not been assessing privacy and security uh, capabilities in organizations, in hospitals, until this coming January. We're evolving the criteria uh, because trends change in the market. And of course, one of the things that we're concerned about is cybersecurity and protecting all of this information that we're collecting on our patients and on our staff and employees in the hospital. So we're, begin, we're going to begin assessing privacy and security capabilities starting in January of 2018. That'll be built into the model. Um, I'm happy to share the specific new capabilities that we're building into it if this is something that interests you. I've got a, another presentation that I'll just send to you. It's pretty straightforward. It compares the current capabilities with the new capabilities. Uh, we're not taking anything away. We're adding a few things, moving a couple of things around, but the model remains intact. Um, these organizations are also virtually paperless. They really don't create paper for anything. Uh, however, what we find is that in some countries around the world, uh, the policies just haven't kept up with the technology. So in countries like uh, China, they, they, the policy is that the official medical record, legal medical record, is the paper record. But yet there are four stage seven hospitals in China, probably be about seven by the end of this year. How, how can they be paperless? How can they be a stage seven and still be required to have a paper record? Well, let me tell you how they do it. They implement an EMR. They meet all of the requirements to get to stage seven. They do all the digital signing online. When the patient's discharged, guess what they do? <laughs> they print the record. And that's the only reason they print it, is because the government says you have, the legal medical record is, is the paper record. So they print it out, put it in a folder, and stick it in a warehouse. And I actually went into one of the warehouses at a hospital, and it was huge. And some of those records can be pretty thick. And I said, well, you should send your paper bill to the government, since they're making you print it. But they didn't laugh at that. <laughs> Uh, anyway, and they're not the only country that has that. In Brazil, they require physicians to purchase digital certificates in order to sign documents uh, digitally. They're not required to, but if you want to have a digital record, you have to have a digital certificate, and I think it costs them, I don't know, $100 US to get a certificate. The government doesn't pay for it, and the hospitals won't pay for it because they say they don't have the money. Some do, though, and there, are, there is one stage seven in Brazil, uh, but what they will typically do is they'll do all of the documentation in the system, and when it comes time, then they'll print everything out, the nurses and the physicians will sign it, and then they just, I don't, some of them scan it back in, which seems like a waste of time, but um, at least they've got everything in the system and they're able to use it as, uh, as they like. But there's, they're virtually paperless. These organizations truly are electronic. Um, they're also fully committed to continuous process improvement. And they, they're, they're not only data driven, but they're data driven because they need that data to drive decisions in the organization. Not just clinical decisions, but financial decisions, process decisions, um, you name it. They're using data to drive the organization forward. So 
profile of a state six state seven organization. All right, once you've got the foundation put in and, and now you've made it to seven and you're ready to optimize and advance, uh, this is where some of the other models come into play. One in particular is the adoption model for analytics maturity. It's a relatively new model, but it's similar in that it's got eight stages, stage zero to stage seven, where stage zero represents an organization that really has no organized strategy around doing analytics in the organization. And then there are specific capabilities and competencies that we're measuring to help an organization build an advanced analytics capability so that by the time they get to stage seven and they're validated at stage seven, they're able to demonstrate that they can do predictive and prescriptive analytics. They can predict a patient's length of stay. They can predict a patient's readmission rate. And not only that, they can prescribe actions interventions to prevent those predictions from coming true. So they're able to do this at stage seven. Right now there are no stage seven or even there's no stage six analytics organizations around the world, but we know stage six and stage seven are achievable. There's a couple of organizations that are getting close. Uh, we know it's achievable when we build these models, we build them in such a way that stage seven is possible. The technologies are there. Uh, the solutions are available. You can, you can implement the capabilities to get to stage seven. Uh, so it's achievable. It may be difficult, like on the EMR adoption model in a lot of places, uh, but it's possible. So uh, that's the analytics model. The digital imaging adoption model, of course, uh, when, we, when you build a foundation, you want everything, all the information, uh, that a physician needs at their fingertips from within the system, and that includes imaging. Not just PACS, DICOM related imaging, but even non-DICOM imaging. If you're taking photos of retinas, uh, ophthalmolo uh, ophthalmology exams, if, you're, if you've got a wound clinic or a wound um, service and you're taking pictures of wounds, or uh, whatever other reason you might be taking photos, um, we want, uh, you want to make sure that that information is also available in the record when the physician needs it to make the right decisions at the right time, right? So the digital imaging adoption model is a model that helps an organization build their digital imaging strategy to make sure that they are, they are uh, optimally managing the images that are being captured on the patients that they're taking care of, whether it's in the hospital or in a diagnostic imaging center uh, or no matter where. And so that model, again, stage zero to stage seven, helps an organization build that strategy to help support the overall care um, process for the patient. So, uh, of course, everybody knows what analytics is. Some people call it clinical intelligence or business intelligence or, or what have you. Uh, in general, as this is sort of driving the point home that you need to build an analytics capability if you want to improve. And to have that analytics capability, you have, the have to have the data foundation with the foundational EMR environment. But you, you've got to have the analytics capability to be able to manage the individual patient to perform some public health service uh, in your community, uh, to do some health information exchange so that you can support any national or regional population health initiatives that might be underway. Uh, we were talking just a little bit earlier about some population health uh, focus initiatives that are going on in, in some of the lens and regions. And you can't do that without data, you can't do it without, without information exchange. And so these models help build uh, that strategy and help you build in these capabilities to perform analytics and population health and, and to encourage patient engagement and all of that. I did a stage seven a hospital visit recently in the US, uh, Tucson Medical Center, and uh, the CEO gave the presentation there as well. And this is how they defined business intelligence. We believe that all levels of the organization should have access to meaningful, accurate data because we believe that data-driven decisions help us to better serve our patients, our employees, and our community. So this is, this is a strategy that they've taken. This is the, the focus that they have, and they understand that in order to have this capability and to improve their, intelli their business intelligence capabilities, they've got to have that, that 
underpinning of technology to give them access to the, the data and the information that they need to be able to do the analytics. The last uh, model that I want to talk about is the continuity of care maturity model. Uh, this one is um, a little unique because it, it goes beyond optimize and uh, uh, advancing your information technology capabilities inside the four walls of your organization and then begins to help you branch outside your organization so that it doesn't matter where a patient, your patient is being treated in the care continuum, whether it's in your emergency department, whether you're admitted, physician's office, a rehab center, home health, hospice, um, you name it, nursing care, it doesn't matter. There should be the ability for this information, the patient's information, to flow from one care setting to the other so that no matter who's taking care of that patient, no matter which physician and what setting, they have at their fingertips all the information they need to make sure they're making the right decision. You've got a patient that uh, you're treating as a, as a physician, primary care physician, and uh, everything's fine. Although your, your patient is allergic to maybe a couple of medications, a couple of drugs, uh, the patient goes out, uh, I don't know, gets into an accident over the weekend, sports events or something, and they show up in the emergency department unconscious. In the emergency department, uh, they need to know what allergies that patient has. But if that patient can't talk, how are they going to know? I give a case study in the presentation that I did in Australia about a similar situation where the patient showed up in the emergency department unconscious. The department had no idea what this patient's medical history was, uh, and it was a trauma situation. They ended up giving the patient six medications in the ED. Turns out that patient was allergic to four of them and died because of the medications that were given. We, we can prevent that. And so the continuity of care maturity model helps us to build a strategy to make sure that no matter where the patient's being seen or treated, their information goes with them so that whoever's taking care of them knows that they're allergic to those four medications and knows I can't give that medication so I gotta do something else. And, and keep them from killing a, a patient, right? So the continuity of care maturity model helps a care community build that sort of capability. And we want to make sure, again, that we're building in different uh, levels of capability. That's why it's seven stages or eight stages, uh, zero to seven, where stage zero represents an organization where there's limited or no communication whatsoever between uh, the healthcare settings in a community, all the way up to stage seven, where it's very knowledge driven, it's dynamic. And again, if no matter where you show up, your information's there, and the physician and the nurse or whoever is taking care of you can make the right decision because they've got everything that they need when they need it. So that's critical. Uh, that it's possible. We, and again, stage seven is achievable, but there are no stage seven organizations yet. Uh, there are some organizations that are close to stage six, but we're continuing to use this model to help organizations begin to build out this capability so that we hope one day and one day soon that we'll start seeing a lot of communities at uh, stage seven of the model. This model helps to build information exchange so that we can get away from this paper record system to this really integrated uh, delivery network, if you will. Uh, you don't have to be part of the same organization. It could be disparate organizations, but we've got to find a way to be able to share this information across organizations. We've got to also be able to coordinate care. How are you taking care of your patient that was just admitted for heart failure and they get discharged and you know they've got heart disease? How are you taking care of them uh, when they're not in the hospital? Or if you're a family practice or cardiology clinic, how are you taking care of your patient in between hospital visits, making sure they're going to the different specialties? So the continuity of care maturity model helps to build that coordinated care capability to make sure that everyone is aware of what's going on with this patient uh, and that anytime that patient's taken care of, no matter where, they, they, the information flows with them. So. That's the models. Uh, again, we don't have any stage six or stage sevens on any of the models except the EMR adoption model and the outpatient EMR adoption model. And you can see here that we've got uh, several countries around the world that have uh, stage six hospitals and clinics, uh, and then stage seven hospitals and clinics as well. 
Uh, and I hope that uh, in the continent of Africa, we'll see our first stage six hospital this December by the end of the year. So this number continues to grow. We're probably, uh, there's probably about 47 countries around the world now that are using this international um, maturity model that is applied consistently uh, in every healthcare market. So there's no maturity model specific to China or Brazil or Australia, it's the same model being applied everywhere, right? So making progress in the world, we still got a long ways to go. Uh, Russia is quickly, uh, I think, gaining interest as well. So we might see Russia light up at least as a stage six relatively soon. So we'll see. Now, in terms of uh, where the markets are from EMR adoption model perspective. So this is just hospitals right now. And that's really all I want to show you. Uh, at this point, but we've comparing the regions here, Asia Pacific, the Middle East, the US and Canada and Europe, uh, and you can see where uh, organizations are uh, or markets are sitting. Uh, I will put some caveat on this slide here because in the US, uh, that number, those numbers represent the entire population of hospitals in the US, acute care hospitals. Whereas in the other regions, it's a representative sample. Uh, although Canada, Canada may be, I don't, you've got more than 641 hospitals across Canada, don't you? No, that, is that, does that sound about right? So maybe it is the population of Canada as well then. Um, I do know we collect data from all the provinces, uh, from all the states in Canada, so uh, that may be a, a population. But the other samples, Europe, Middle East, and Asia, are not uh, populations, they're really samples. Uh, but you can see uh, the highlights, the dark boxes represent the largest percentage of hospitals in that particular region. And you can see Canada's hospitals, uh, about 31% of the hospitals are still at stage three. There is one stage seven hospital in Canada, and in fact it is the only stage seven hospital in the world that is an acute behavioral health hospital. It is in Ontario. It's Ontario Shores. Ontario Shores is a, it was the first, is the first and only acute behavioral health hospital at, that has achieved stage seven. We might see a second one this year uh, in, uh, in Canada. So keep your ears open for a press release because that uh, visit, if it hasn't happened already, will be happening soon. Uh, and of course, I can't tell you who it is because I, if they don't make it, I don't want them to be embarrassed. Uh, but hopefully they'll see two. But again, Canada will have the only two hospitals in the world that are acute behavioral health hospitals that have been able to achieve stage seven, but it is possible. Uh, so you should be very proud of that. Um, the other thing I will comment about Canada, I think the reason that your hospitals uh, are uh, sort of uh, at the stage two and stage three level is because your focus is really in primary care, right? You're really focused on health care in, in the doctor's office. Uh, that's not so much the case in the U.S. or perhaps in other markets. Uh, but that's one thing I, I like about the Canadian market because it makes sense. 90% of health care is delivered in a physician's office, right? So that's where you should be focusing. Um, all right, so that's where the world is today in terms of uh, EMR adoption. So what's next? Let's talk about this. This may spark some discussion now, I think. I talked about the EMR adoption model criteria being updated. Uh, this model is about, uh, it's over a decade old. We launched it in 2005. We didn't see the first stage seven hospital in the US until 2009. There have been some incentives that have been put in place to help drive EMR adoption in hospitals in the US, uh, namely, extra funding from the government, so that has helped a lot, uh, which is why I think the U.S. numbers are, are higher than the rest of the world because uh, uh, that incentive. Uh, but we also know that things change, and, and so we've been watching the different markets around the world, watching the trends, and as a result of some of the trends that are occurring, uh, it, it, we decided that it was time to make some adjustments to the EMR adoption model. We made some adjustments in 2014 only by adding the requirement for hospitals to include blood products and human milk in that medication closed loop process. 
where you're using technology to positively identify the patient and the blood product or the human milk and, and uh, making sure that you're giving the right milk or the right blood product to the right patient. So that, is, that was a new requirement that was added to stage seven in 2014, 2015 timeframe. But since then, we've been working with various organizations around the world, including in Canada, and um, we have come up with some new criteria that we're building into the model. And the majority of that revolves around privacy and security. So we've embedded, uh, embedded some privacy and security requirements that will go into effect in, Janu in January. We also found that uh, PACS and imaging has become very, uh, very common around the world where I, you can't really walk into a hospital who doesn't have digital imaging. Uh, and so what we've decided to do is take PACS out of stage five move it to stage one, uh, so um, that was one of the, the moves that we made. Um, and, and there's a few other changes, but the, the, the criteria does evolve over time because we want it to be able to reflect what the current trends are, and in this case, uh, we're implementing some new uh, privacy and security requirements, so that means we are focused on privacy and security as well. Uh, so we hope that uh, this will help organizations begin to more proactively assess their privacy and security capabilities to try to prevent some of the ransomware and other hacking incidents from occurring within healthcare organizations. So we'll see what impact it'll have uh, a year from now. The other thing that we're looking at is uh, this idea of, of building a maturity model around value. A lot of organizations, particularly the government in the U.S., when they started giving out this, these billions of dollars to organizations saying, you know, if you demonstrate meaningful use, we'll give you extra money for taking care of your patients. And then a, there's been a lot of debate on what does meaningful use mean, right? Um, and so they, now Congress has been asking some questions, well, what are, what are we getting out of that? We've made this huge investment, but what difference has it really made in terms of value, right? So we've been toying around with the idea of building a model that allows an organization to be able to demonstrate how they've been able to solve that value equation. In other words, are they able to demonstrate that they've achieved the value that they've expected out of their IT investments? When you think about that, a lot of people might automatically think about ROI. Well, ROI is good, but ROI typically refers to uh, financial metrics. But of course, as you know, it's value in healthcare is not just about financial metrics. It really is about that plus quality, plus safety, plus uh, you know, improved outcomes, all of that. So how do you factor that into a value equation and at the end of the day, be able to demonstrate that we've invested all of this effort, time, money, resources into investing in information technology. What are we really getting out of it? So what we're thinking is building a model, eight stage model, zero to seven, where stage zero represents an organization that really has no clue what benefit they're getting out of their IT investments, to stage seven, which represents an organization that has solved the value equation, and they, can clear, they have clearly defined the value that they expect from their IT investments. They're able to measure that value, and at the end of the day, show that yes, we have achieved the value that we expected from our IT investments, or we haven't, or we're getting close, right? So that's the model that we're toying around with right now. We have a framework in place. I hope that uh, after the 1st of July, I'll be able to build a value model working group that will be internationally represented. Hopefully we can have someone from Canada participate in the work group and begin to build out the actual criteria in the model. What we're not going to do with the model is establish specific value metrics. I, I, we can't really get into the business of telling you, if you achieve this metric, you're getting value out of your IT investment. Because if you ask in the US, 5,478 hospitals, how they define value for their organization, you're probably gonna get 5,478 different answers and different metrics and so forth. So we're not, we're not defining the specific metrics but we want you to demonstrate that you've got the capability to identify specifically what you want to get in value out of your IT investments and then be able to measure whether or not you're getting that value and then to show us at the end of the day 
the results, right? So that's the direction we're going. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, produce something uh, within a year that, that is uh, relatively baked that we can begin to then pilot, introduce, and, and see how it works. Uh, a lot of organizations have been asking for this. We're working with a, a large health system on the East Coast in the U.S. who is trying to answer that question a lot quicker than we're able to get this model out. So uh, they're, they're going to be working with us, and we're going to work with them to try to uh, use their experiences to help us uh, bake some of those lessons learned into the model. So keep an eye out for that. If that's something you might be interested in, let me know uh, in terms of working on the working group. We'd love to have the Canadian voice in that. Um, a couple of other models that we're looking at, supply chain management. Uh, there's a, an organization in Canada that has won a grant for um, exploring the idea of building a, a maturity model around supply chain management, and they've come to us to help them do that. And so that project is just kicking off. I don't know if supply chain management is top of mind for some of you in the audience. Um, I'd love to see a show of hands if if that is something that, that you're working on now. So I see one. Okay, so uh, might be something that you'd be interested in if we begin to, to move that one forward. Uh, so uh, stay in touch. <laughs> uh, and then infrastructure maturity model. This one's a little bit more nebulous. Uh, we have a, a couple of vendors that have come to us and said, you know, we have a great model we'd like for you to use. Um, and so we're going back and forth on what that might look like. Of course, they want to have their name on it, but like I said earlier, we're vendor neutral, and we won't agree to that. Uh, if, if somebody want, has built a model and they want us to use it, we'll look at it, and if it looks like something that is beneficial and of value to the health markets around the world, then we will um, modify it and adjust it to make sure it truly is vendor agnostic, technology neutral, uh, and uh, build it in such a way that it can actually be helpful and valuable to organizations and not, um, not a, uh, a vendor scheme is the word I'm thinking of, but it may not be the right word, I don't know, uh, a way for a vendor to make money uh, through the Hems brand, and we don't want to do that. So we're really focused on bringing only the right tools that bring value to you guys. And so then, uh, those are the big rocks. I guess we're focused on question marks. What's next? I mean, are the things that I haven't talked about that you guys are really concerned about that we need to be thinking about? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, uh, of course. And, and now, I think we've got time to have a quick conversation around that. Actually, we may not. <laughs> Matthew, I'm sorry. I took up more time than I expected. But I'm done. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. I hope this information was helpful. We've got, we've got about four minutes for some Q&A, and I think you have uh, the first question is over there. So when I see the reference to privacy and security, I, I differentiate between the two. I see security as being a technical standard. I see privacy as being a regulatory standard, a regulatory standard driven by the jurisdictions where Ontario and Canada would probably at the, be at the top end. So for the purposes of, of your MRAM scale and your standard around privacy, is it an absolute standard as against a technical spec or is it based on local regulatory compliance? And is it, based, is it going to be a, a level six requirement or a level seven requirement? Yeah, so, um, okay, so first of all, they're embedded in several stages of the model, starting with stage two, uh, from very basic capabilities like antivirus, anti-malware capabilities. Uh, and so having said that, a lot of it is focused on the technological aspects of it, but we also focus on the policy aspect as well. For example, do you have an appropriate use policy in place? Or an acceptable use policy, I should say. And uh, if you have an acceptable use policy in place, how often do you review it? Uh, how often, you know, um, do, you, do you train users on that policy? How many users have you trained on the policy? Um, another example would be uh, risk assessments. Uh, have you conducted a risk assessment in the last 12 months? And not only have you conducted the risk assessment, have you reported the results of that risk assessment to a governing body of some sort that can actually take action against the, whatever gaps you've identified in that assessment? So physical access policy, uh, do you have a physical access policy in place? Have you defined who can have access to what? And 
physical access to the data center, physical access to the EMR. Um, how are you protecting that information from a policy perspective? So we are looking at the policies in addition to the technical capabilities. Let me focus the question a bit more specific to Ontario. So our privacy commissioner makes rulings that require uh, EMR suppliers to actually change the functionality of their systems in a way that provides less patient efficacy mm -hmm. but meets his privacy platinum standard. And so are these standards going to require uh, regulatory compliance in order to get to the higher levels? No, 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 no. no. It, it, no because the regulatory requirements vary so much from country to country and right. market to market. So we stay out of enforcing regulatory requirements. We're looking for the basic capabilities that you've put into place to ensure that you're able to protect and secure the information that you're collecting in your information systems on your patients and your staff. That's extremely helpful. Yep. In your slide, you reference milk products and, and blood as a level six, but in your presentation, you, you reference it as level seven. In the current criteria, it's level seven. In the new criteria that go into effect in January, we've moved it to stage six. Okay, thank you. Yes, good questions. Thank you. We are out of time. Sorry. <laughs> Great questions. I, I, if I could just say one thing about this slide here, this is from a hospital in Argentina who was struggling getting to stage seven because they couldn't figure out how to put barcodes on little glass vials. So they went to Coca-Cola because they know Coca-Cola bottles have barcodes on them. Coca-Cola said, hey, go to our barcode labeling company. They went to that company, had a conversation, and what resulted is this vile barcode labeler that they implemented in the hospital. So the point is, where there's a will to get something done, you'll find a way to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. So thank you very much, um, have a good morning. This is uh, the last Breakfast of the Chiefs for the summer. Uh, we are back in September and we'll be kicking off with uh, Susan Smith-Patrick, the uh, President and CEO of Toronto Central Lynn. Thank you.